my machine to work. Um, as you know, our mission is, is really about getting outside of our silos um, as agile practitioners, getting outside of our, even our global silos and, and really tapping into that collective intelligence as a group. And so, you know, we want to provide speakers and opportunities for, for us all to connect in that way. And, and just for a place for you to grow and, and, and learn. And, and really one of the best ways that, that you can do that besides our meetups, um, you know, those are, um, they're obviously a little bit more one-sided toward, towards the speaker, but really the great, the great thing is, is there are other ways to connect with us. And one is, um, um, one of the most important ways to connect with us is through our Discord server. So for those who aren't familiar with Discord, that is very much like Slack or Teams and where you have channels. And there is a quite um, a growing community of Scrum Masters of the Universe members that are out there on that Discord server and they're asking questions, they're sharing new things that they've tried, they're sharing learnings, they're sharing things that maybe didn't go so well, but what they learned from it, there are all kinds of things. And so, um, so some, some of the times they're just having fun and talking about anything but Agile or Scrum. So there's a lot there for you. I really, really, really encourage you to get involved with the community on our Discord server because that's where the community really happens. Okay, so I introduce our leadership team. Um, you have myself and Mark Metz, and, and you have Jeff here, and we have two members, uh, two new members that are here today, so hopefully they'll wave at you. Um, um, Scrum Masters of the Universe is growing, but it's a great problem to have is we didn't have enough, enough people to help us do what we do, so so um, Jeff has been added um, more recently. You've seen, you've started to see Jeff around, but um, um, today is Mary and John's first um, meetup. So Mary and John, if you just want to quick give away, if we've got two new uh, two new members of on our leadership team, so welcome, welcome, welcome. All right, and um, our upcoming events. We have a lot of upcoming events um, actually, and I am trying to find the page that has our upcoming events, but. Um, I'll just bring them up here, the harbor. It's just that this, um, we, t we tend to lose um, screen sharing and Zoom and I are not getting along. Let's just put it that way. So bear with me here, but um, we should have a link already in your, in your chat about our upcoming events, but we, and see, you see, it's not even putting the, my lovely pictures, but today's our epic refinement event. Um, we have Steve Traps coming up with how many coaches does it take to change a light bulb? We have Patty coming back really for part two. Um, it's called Experimentation in Scrum Teams. And if you didn't see part one, don't worry. Part two is a standalone, but if you really want to, um, She's really talking about why are we afraid to experiment and where did that come from? And that's kind of what she talked about in part one. And, and so that's the, what your science teacher never taught you about empiricism. And then in part two, we're gonna talk about an experimentation and scrum teams and, and why that's so difficult and how can we make, how can we help our teams be more comfortable with experimentation? Then we have Angela Johnson coming up with get your hands off teams work. We've got Jimmy Janlin, Power and Pains of Autonomy. Um, and then a couple um, that I'm looking, really looking, I'm looking forward to all of them, but um, a couple of really looking forward to um, coming is Moving Your Scrum Downfield. I know many of you have probably read this white paper. It's been out for a while with Gunther Verheyen, um, but he is, he's, he's been willing to come to Scrum Master of the Universe. This will be his second time with us. So super excited he's coming back on that one. He's made some changes to that and, and looking forward to, to um, his 2022 version. And then um, coming up in February, we have uh, Lead Without Blame with um, Diana Larson and she'll be talking about her, the newest book she wrote with Trisha Broderick. So that should be pretty exciting. So good things coming up. Check out the link, check, um, go there and um, sign up for events. 
And now my PowerPoint's up. All right. So again, I just want to say thank you to our sponsors. Without them, we couldn't do what we do. Um, and so we've got Scrum.org, Agile Alliance, Rebel Scrum, OptiLearn, um, Scrum Mastered. I've got their over high end, Agile.ai. Um, so thank you so much to those sponsors. Um, and last but not least, and this is what you all came for, um, came for today is, is better results with Epic Refinement, with the Epic Refinement event with Daniel Mezik. So really, really super excited to meet Daniel today. And um, and of course, um, I'm really struggling. I hope you guys are very gracious today because I have lost my notes on uh, my introduction to, <laughs> to Daniel. So that's not exciting, but I'm gonna stop sharing and go back to um, normal event and I am going to hand it over to Dan, Daniel Messick and Daniel, you're going to have to bail me out. And, and Daniel and I um, have become friends over the last several months. And, and he has done a lot of work with, with open, with um, open agility. And I, I think I'm just going to let him give a little bit. Yeah, that's I know cool. We've got something in chat here and sorry, Daniel, I lost my notes completely. And I no sweat, no, no, sweat. no problem at all. So yeah. bail so, me out. Yeah. So um, welcome and greetings to everyone here. Thank you for your valuable time showing up to listen to someone like me talk about something like this. Um, okay. I hope you had a good holiday time and that things are cool with you. And, um, you know, I come from a development background have a computer science degree, talked at a lot of de developer conferences. And one thing that turns developer audiences off is the speaker going off on their CV and their resume at the beginning of the talk. So um, let's just dive right in. I'm going to share my screen and we're going to walk through uh, this presentation together. And then the latter half of the thing will be questions, right? So hopefully there'll be plenty of questions um, as we go along. I am coming to you from our undisclosed location here in North Guilford, Connecticut, USA, about halfway between New York and Boston, and about a half an hour from New Haven, Connecticut, home of Yale University. So there I am. So now let me go and share my screen here. And uh, this is the slide deck. Um, slide decks are typically quite boring. So um, it might be good for you to minimize that or make it a 50-50 on my face or something like this as you go along. Um, let's get started, shall we? Okay, so here's the problem, right? This is a problem that I've encountered in actual practice as a um, consulting uh, executive coach, team coach, scrum master, I've done all those things. I tend to do more executive coaching now, but here's the problem. In the largest orgs, we have big upfront planning events and these events, by definition, are dealing with incomplete information. So we're making guesses, right? This is what's basically going on. So we're making guesses about things um, that we're going to commit potentially hundreds and hundreds of people um, if we're a product company. And um, we're, we're making stuff up. Um, that's the sanitized way of, of what I wanted to say. We're making stuff, <laughs> we're making stuff up. So, so. You know, normally the guess of when we'll be able to finish everything can vary by two standard deviations, which means it's just a wild ass guess, right? And we're going to commit all these people to all this development, you know, potentially dozens of teams, right? So then the engineers are 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 committed to a um, a date and a set of deliverables, and the clock starts ticking. And, and they may not be able to um, really figure out what's going on with those epics. And they might need to go to the product manager and ask specific questions. But in many large organizations, the, the product person that um, helps to lead that team, you know, um, they, their time is scarce and valuable. And often there's not enough product managers. So often product managers are dealing with multiple teams in multiple um, trade-offs and all kinds of customer things that are happening and in all kinds of emergent be, you know, stuff that comes up throughout their day. 
So the, getting pinning them down can be tough. Also, they might live in a geo that's not yours. They might be like six hours away, even nine hours away. So now we've got that 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 conflict or um, that challenge as well, right? So for all these reasons, product managers can be hard to locate and hard to pin down with an answer because first you have to get access and then you have to get the question answered. So how are we gonna do that? Um, a lot of times uh, there's something, if you've read deeply on Scrum, there's something called tacit knowledge and something called explicit knowledge, right? So explicit knowledge, you can boil it down to documentation, a video, an audio. Tacit knowledge is like you have to work with the person to get the knowledge. It's not readily reducible to documentation because it's either emergent or very complex or both, right? Sound familiar? So we need access to the product manager if we're going to have any chance of good success with the big upfront planning, okay? So that's the setup to the problem. What is the actual problem? Here it is. The engineering, the engineering teams are left largely to guess. And then because of time pressure, they might start coding based on their best guesses because they know the clock is ticking. So even though they can't get to their PM, they, they will read over the stuff and take a shot, right? The other thing is that those guesses are often wrong, right? So what happens at the end is at the end, all of a sudden, you know, PM time becomes available and we show them what we've delivered and they're like, uh, that's not what I had in mind at all. And now there's a, a whole crisis at the end that's um, release pressure, time pressure, delivery pressure. We might be working nights, weekends and holidays and so forth, right? So this is the solution right here. And this is the end of the text on the slides, by the way, I'm gonna be showing diagrams from now on. So I hope that that excites you. and um, keeps you here you might be thinking oh my god it's all text this is so boring but no i'm going to go to diagrams in just a minute so so here's the solution an event that i call epic refinement and here's how here's what it is it's a one hour meeting twice a week with the pm and the the basic uh focus is on single epics where it's an ask me anything about that epic engineers ask questions the pm provides answers and notes are made and taken, and then the, the stories are uh, are written. So the goal of this is to take one big, huge epic that might actually be more than one release cycle wide, and often is, and turn it into five or six one sprint wide large stories or sub epics that become the starting point for the team level refinement. So teams now are getting something normalized, right? So it has a, a standard size, it has a, it's 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 spoken of in a standard format like uh, user story format or given when then. It has a clear definition of done and it has priority guidance, right? So we know from queuing theory uh, in in lean that that same same size items through a queue move faster than variable sized items. So right off the bat, we're going to get a speed increase when teams start their epic refinement process, right? Okay. So. This is this is what we've done. There's some roles, by the way. Um, there at the at the meeting, there's the product manager who answers questions. There's engineers who ask questions. Maybe the engineering lead, engineering manager. The scrum master facilitates the process and keeps everything at a very high level. We don't get down into technical details in this meeting if we unless we absolutely have to. Okay. And then the scrum master brings us back to a high level business vision point of view. And then we've separated out the product manager from the product owner. And I want to talk about that a little bit now. And the reason why, hold on just a second. Uh, boom and boom. And there we go. So PMs have a one-to-many relationship between um, the work and their teams. So one PM could have multiple teams that they're directing the work of, right? So that kind of pressure makes it almost impossible them to, for them to function as a good product owner. They just don't have enough time. Any of you that are product owners are already know that, um, you know, <laughs> more than one product is, is typically too much for, uh, for a product uh, owner. So imagine a, you're a PM and you're expected to be the, P, the PO for four teams. That's just not going to fly, right? So what we do is we we have a PO who typically comes from the engineering side 
and they answer day-to-day -day questions. They make decisions day-to-day. -day. They prioritize day-to-day. -day. They represent the PM day-to-day -to, -day to the engineering team, and they represent the PM intent to the team as well. And then these two are in constant communication. So the, the PO and the PM have each other on speed dial on their phones and they can just, they have a working agreement, like it's like SLA service level agreement to stop what they're doing and take each other's calls. Okay. And you can use Slack or other support, but the main idea is that they're constantly talking every day. They might be talking five times a day. Okay over Slack or over email or, or some kind of phone, maybe a text or a phone call, something like that. And the PM stays sort of above it all at the product vision level, owns the product vision, owns the prioritization of epics, defines the epics and explains them to the team uh, for one hour per session, two hour, two, two sessions per week. Okay, so there's that. Now, this is what's really going on usually is the PM has all these forces pressing in on them, right? And the PO is part of that. So the product organization, the competition, customers, Intel for marketing, customer support, sales, all these, consti all these constituencies are vying for the time of the PM. Okay, so this sort of above the line and below the line. Above the line is like sort of the mess and then below the line is where Scrum happens, right? And what we do is we start with epic refinement. We take what very, very large stories, we break them down so they have a, a size, a priority, they have a clear definition of done. Um, they're, they're expressed in a standard format like um, given when then or user story format, right? So the basic flow is stuff comes out of the big upfront planning process then it's input into this epic refinement um, event that happens twice a week. The, what comes out of there is sent to the team and they do their team level ready refinement, getting ready for the, the next sprint. So actually their, their refinement is, is almost like rolling sprint planning. Like they're doing this sprint planning like every, like twice a week for an hour, an hour and a half as they, as they prepare ready backlog. So the regular sprint planning becomes a formality, right? Because everyone knows what the stories mean. So I need to tell you something about this. When we do this epic refinement meeting, what happens is in the beginning of the release cycle, there's a lot of questions from the engineering team to the PM. And there's a lot of back and forth and the right conversations are taking place and spikes are being identified, right? In the second half of the release planning cycle, if we're doing it right, there's no more questions. The team is clear on what those epics meant and, and they broke them down um, in epic refinement into one sprint stories. So each epic goes to four or five or six one sprint stories. And they've also identified most of the spikes early in the process. So they don't really have much discovery left in the second half. But in the first half of the release cycle, there's a lot of discovery, a lot of conversation. And those two hours are absolutely necessary in the beginning of the release cycle. At the end of the release cycle, you could you could drop it down to one hour of epic refinement and you would be okay. And what most teams wind up doing is they wind up looking forward to the next release cycle. So now they're getting ahead of it. And now we're getting a much clearer set of epics coming out of the next release cycle. Okay, so anybody have a question, quick question here before I go any further uh, with this diagram? If, if you have a question... Uh, just raise your hand or put it in the chat and, and one of the moderators will will uh, will um, give you the floor. We did have um, someone make a comment that this seems to be geared towards towards a um, scaled agile framework environment. Um, no, 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 no. To put put it more properly, scaled agile framework environment is uh, pertains to a large large organizations with dozens of teams. That's what's really going on here. So you might say, oh, this looks a lot like rolling wave planning, right? Well, okay, call it that if you want. The main thing is te the, the teams need to understand those epics and it's unreasonable and unfair for us to assume that everything is known upfront when those epics are, are drafted, right? So that's my answer to that question about C. Is there another question I can answer? Or should I keep going? 
What is, um, I think there's some questions about um, some of your acronyms here, EM and S. Yeah, that's the engineering, engineering manager. PM is product manager. SL, uh, we, uh, I often, I commonly use the term scrum lead to describe uh, the scrum master and a lot of the orgs that I work in now. Um, and then PO is obvious and there's a scrum lead again. So the scrum lead straddles the scrum team and what we, in red, we might call the product team. These guys meet once, uh, twice a week for one hour, right? Or the engineering lead, right? So somebody who has good authority around engineering needs to be at that meeting. The PM certainly needs to be there to answer questions. And the scrum lead keeps it moving and focused on one epic at a time. And then the scrum lead also straddles and, and works with the scrum, the scrum team all the time. So what we have is a PO, a PO that is authorized by the PM. And they, they answer the day-to-day -day, day -day stuff. And the PM is freed up. They have two hours of epic refinement a week. And they're required to come to the demo and provide feedback. Okay. All right, so let me keep going. Go, another you wanna, question, right? You wanna, we have um, another question, unless you want to keep going. Oh, no, another question. Go. Sure. Yeah, um, so the question yeah. is, is it always top down? Um, it seems like everything starts from the epic. Yeah, because what, what happens is usually um, large organizations that have products or multiple lines of business, they have initiatives, right, that they're trying to achieve um, that are that are there's a one to many between an initiative and an, and a, and an epic. Um, so one initiative could have many epics and those epics form containers, right? When we, when you get it into an epic state, okay, now we can give it a name and it's got a handle and we can grab it. Right. But before that, it was just sort of squishy. Right. So what we're trying to do in the big upfront planning process, what I've seen in the largest companies is that the engineering leads and the engineering managers weigh in on the uh, epic um, drafting and they provide guidance on how realistic this stuff is as best they can. And then, and then the release cycle kicks off, okay? So the, the, the idea of reducing things to epics is mostly about trying to put them in a container with a name so we can sort of wrestle it to the ground Right, so things are bundled up in epics first, and then they're they're broken down into large stories or sub epics uh, during the epic refinement event, and then those two sprint those uh, one sprint wide stories, usually two weeks wide, are um, are presented to the team, and of course they have attributes of priority. Um, um, they're uh, they're in a given when then or user story or some other standard format. Um, they have a clear definition of done, right? So they have some extra tags on them that, that help the team to make a meaning about what this thing is. But it's not people who are far away from the work who are writing those epics. It's it's the engineering leads and engineering managers. Okay, so I want to keep going. Here's, here's how that looks a little bit uh, deeper. Same look, but you can see the PO straddles. Here, I'm, here I've, I've, di I've diverged back to the scrum master. Um, but basically, look at the black piece, right? So the product team takes epics from the big upfront planning process, reduces these, reduces them to one sprint stories, and then they are presented to the team um, as backlog uh, um, for back for team level refinement. Here's sort of the wider picture, and there's a legend here. The blue is where the events are at, the green is where the artifacts are at, and the red is where the roles are at. So as, and this is time, right? These arrows are moving through time. So we have epics and then we boil them down to sub epics through epic refinement. And then the team through the team level, ready refinement gets to a ready state and that's input into sprint planning. The, my litmus test for teams is, do you understand what these stories mean? If you do not understand what they mean, do not go into sprint planning. It's a waste of time. You've got to go back and really understand the requirements at the top of the backlog. The first, the next couple of sprints, at least, you have to understand those. Otherwise, you'll have no shot. What will happen will be, <coughs> pardon me, got a little cold. I'm trying to get rid of. Um, what will happen is, is uh, there'll be more guessing going on during sprints. There'll be more guessing going on during sprint planning. There'll be less um, 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 valid estimations. 
the backlog refinement will be close to non-existent, right? The, 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 the discipline, the backlog refinement discipline will be close to non-existent. When, when teams go into sprint planning without pre-digesting that stuff, okay? So here's another look at that. And this was on the headline slide. Epic refinement, you take a big red thing and you reduce it into five or six blue things. They're small, they're two weeks wide or one sprint wide. And we call those sub epics or, or large stories. Jira does not have something called a sub epic. So you have to use an ugly hack with tags uh, to do that. That's a, that, that whole thing about tools is another problem that I'm gonna talk about later um, in, in, a, in a future session someday maybe. So it's like a promise that um, I'll talk about it if I get invited back. But tools constrain your thinking in a, in a way that will totally limit your creativity. And Jira certainly does that. Okay, so here's how this looks. These black uh, dots uh, that are numbered are pointing to the prioritization. So the last thing that happens is the team has some sub epics from previous epic refinement events. And now new ones come in and then they're sorted and sifted into the prioritization. So the team always has clear guidance. Where does this go? Does it go to the bottom? Because we're doing it next or does it go to the top? Where does it go, right? And the engineering team gets that guidance. And this is what their backlog looks like when we start uh, from a big upfront process, which we, you know, is referred to often as PPC. Basically, you have epics, and then you have some sub epics that are already pre digested. They go off to the engineering team when the prioritization and all the other um, attributes are attached to those, right? So, this is what the engineering, this is what the product team is usually dealing with um, as a kind of backlog a bunch of red epics and a few that they've already worked on that are queued up and ready to go to the engineering team. And then here's the backlog item types. And just as a quick reminder, not everything is features, right? There's spikes, there's compliance, there's technical debt, there's rework, there's maintenance. There, of course, there's, there's estimates and refinements. So this stuff needs to make it into your backlog too, if you're gonna have any chance of completing your planned work. And um, this is sort of the team level micro view Team gets gets uh, the output from Epic Refinement, and then they they meet a couple of hours a week uh, when they're inspired, and they get it into the ready state. So it has a priority value, it has an estimate value, and ideally it has a a value score or a value estimate as well. So the estimate divided the value divided by the estimate could give us a a, a rough priority. This is bang for the buck. So say the value of something is a ten, and the effort is a one, then it's its weighted priority is 10. But if its value is 10 and, and, and the effort is a two, well, then its weighted priority is a five, right? So this is like, um, uh, what do they call it? A safe, uh, least weighted job first, right? Bang for the buck. Um, it's not a bad idea to use value divided by estimate as, a, um, as an initial cut on the uh, priority, okay? <clears throat> we had one, one question that, that kind of came up before we go on. What was the uh, meeting of the meaning of PPC? I know that's kind of your your larger. Yeah, just plan. think of it as just think of it as the big upfront plan. The it's the last step in the big upfront plan. Don't worry about what the acronym means. Just understand that what the teams are receiving are epics of all various shapes and sizes coming out of this last part of the of the big upfront plan process, right? So that's what that is. So who, who's got another question? Okay, good. I'll keep sharing and I'll, I'll finish up and then I'll take a bunch of questions, hopefully. Oh, can everyone see that? Yep. Okay, good. All right. And this is what the team's backlog looks like or, or the whole, this is how, what the whole backlog looks like. We have, we have, we have epics that are produced by initiatives we have this epic refinement process that breaks them down into sub epics that we attach a priority to. And then they, they get they get sent to the team as these smaller things that are one sprint wide. And then the top of the team's backlog, you know, the overall backlog for a team, ready backlog, two or three sprints worth, uh, smaller epics that have to be sifted into the prioritization, uh, smaller epics uh, that are, you know, being worked on. And then epics being worked on by the product folks and the engineer, you know, the top engineers. And then the um, 
the epics themselves. So this is sort of a, a four zone view of what the entire backlog looks like. Really big things, medium sized things, some of which are, are have made it over to the team and then ready things that come out of team level refinement. I'm having trouble. There we go. All right, so now it's time for questions and you can ask me absolutely anything. And by anything, I do mean anything. So, so you, you can reach me in these ways um, on uh, our website, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, right? By email. Um, so go ahead, ask me any question you like. Yeah, and you can put it in chat here or, sure. or just um, on sure, I can drop it into chat. Uh, yeah, these, all these lines. Can, but there was a question about someone wanted to, um, wanted you to explain what spikes mean to you. Spikes? Uh, spikes are research tasks. They are basically inputs into understanding stories that need to be done two or three or four sprints out. So they are knowledge gathering um, activities that are bounded by time. So if you send me on a spike, it's going to be a half a day, a day, two days, and I'm going to go and do a deep dive on something. So, you know, over time, my interest in the topic is very, very low. Right. And then it, when the spike happens, my, the, my interest spikes and it goes for the length of the spike and then exponential decay in my interest. I go back to my regular job. So spikes are research tasks that are sized by time, uh, limited by time. And if then more research has to happen, then we'll do more spikes. But first, there's spike topics or spike um domains that you need to identify like we don't know we don't know enough about domain x we need to go learn about domain x okay then you send me to learn about domain x and i come back and i go all right i did my spike for a day and a half here's what i learned about domain x and here's some specific further spikes that we need to get done based on what i learned over there right so it's a it's a forward plan where you're looking ahead two, three, four sprints. I wouldn't look more than five sprints ahead, but you should be starting to build knowledge to reach that ideal state where the whole team knows what the stories mean. And they're not guessing because they've done the research and it's been, it's been budgeted in. So it's a really good idea to keep statistics on your spike generation and this amount of time spent on spikes in a given release cycle. And that will allow you to budget um, um, and to dummy out or to put placeholders for spike type work, right? And we saw in the earlier uh, slide there about like, you know, what are some of the pieces of things that go into the backlog? It's not just features, it's, it's also spikes, right? And lots of other things. So you need to budget for those things or they just won't happen, right? And you do that by collecting stats and making a logical, rational, auditable case for why we need to devote 7% of every sprint to spikes. So if we have a capacity of 100 story points for this team, the effective capacity is 93. Because we know for a fact that we're going to do at least seven points of spike work every single sprint on average. And then if you don't do spike work, like late in the release cycle, say, well, then you should use stretch items during sprint planning. The product product uh, owner uh, should be telling you, hey, if you finish early, pull pull this item from the backlog. This one right here, number four, five, six, right? So I hope I answered that question good enough for the uh, for the questioner, and I certainly hope I answered it correctly. Is there anyone else who would like to me to answer a question? So. There was one um, earlier um, from Daniel. Um, I, I've seen situations where there's an architect who is very senior tech person that guides the architecture design of large bodies of work. It wasn't the engineering manager who did it. Have you seen that? Yeah, and I don't like that. I think it's a failure pattern. And, and why so? Because from the very beginning, the technical considerations have to be included. Otherwise you get a big surprise halfway through the release cycle about technology considerations. So I want to see 
engineering managers, engineering leads involved very early in the site in the, um, I want them involved in the upfront planning um, process. If they're not, number one, they don't have a seat at the table. So that's not, that's a bad idea. I mean, these are your top technical people. Why aren't you tapping their expertise at the earliest possible time, right? Maybe they just come in and listen and observe. And if they have something to say, they make a throat clearing sound and then they jump in and they say something. Okay, and then Andre Christi, Christian, Christi, Cristiano? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so um, I'm saying this and pop up something in my mind uh, about dependency. So usually in a large scale or uh, big setup uh, teams, uh, the one thing that uh, sapping the energy of the people is the dependencies. Right. What do you think about it? Right. So, so your your technical people who you know your architectural you know first of all your architectural people have to be capable of doing everyone else's job in engineering. If they can't do everyone else's job in engineering, uh, they're probably not qualified to be an architect. That's my that's the story I'm sticking with. Okay. So let's assume that you have great technical people who are, you know, doing, they're on like an architectural council or something like that. They are going to be able to identify dependencies right away because they work with many of the teams. They understand what the dependencies are and they're going to be able to identify them and list them as spike domains, spike topics, something that needs more research. Just by listening to the conversation, you know, they can see how, you know, the product conversation is going a certain way and doesn't assume um, dependencies when in fact there's 10 of them, right? So, so this is, uh, my answer to your question is dependencies are, the earlier you can identify dependencies, the happier everyone is. Well, not everyone, but almost everyone. All right, is there another question I can, I can. There is a question from the chat. Um, do you have a recommended Epic format? I like, I like a standard form for epics. I don't care what it is that you use, but agree on something. So Ooh. there's many kinds of ways to express epics. And if you go around, you'll find ways to do that around the web. I don't have any one favorite way. Well, actually I do. My favorite way is the one that the organization, the people who do the actual work, decide will work best for them. And it wouldn't just be one format. There might be a suite of formats depending on the epic type, right? So one size does not fit all and not all epics are the same. So you're gonna use maybe a couple of different formats for to so you have some, some, some adjustability um, in the way you describe these epics, but you keep it to a short list of two or three uh, ways to express an epic at the most. And it's the same two or three every time. Thank That's going to speed everyone up. Jen, you mind if I ask a follow-up question? Of course, yeah. Go. In regards to the epics, you know, I, I totally get what you're saying around there being a whatever it is. Just make sure it's standardized so that there's consistency and repeatability. How much information should be in the epic, say, versus a complementary document such as a BRD or something along those lines? Right, right. So I want you to look up. Um, the term commander's intent. It's a military term. And the commander's intent is the outcome desired, right? So that's what I really want to see included in the epics. What's the outcome that's desired? And what's the why behind this desired outcome? So I want the desired outcome. I want the why. And I want it in a standard format. So we can wrestle this thing to the ground and actually deliver it on time. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Now the question. Well, there's an easy one. Um, will we? Um, will you be giving me access to the slides so that I can send it out to everyone? Yes, and I already sent it to you. Oh, you're on the ball. I don't yeah, know I'm trying. Well, I'm there. trying to be. You know, I mean, we. I I have a meetup. We have a meetup in Boston called Agile Boston that's been going for almost 15 years. 
and I'm very familiar with speakers who don't never get the slides or never get them on time. So I, I totally <laughs> sent them as soon as they were fully baked. But you know that every speaker yeah. is tweaking these slides right up to the last minute, right? So you'll see that I sent you the slides like 15 minutes before the, the actual meeting. Oh, perfect. <laughs> okay. perfect. Yeah. Um, and then I don't know if you want to stop sharing your screen so we can see if anyone raises their hands. I Oh, I sure. I covered them all from chat. If I didn't, if I missed you, just raise your hand or speak up, unmute yourself and speak up. Um, it's pretty informal here. And we do have 93 people here, so it's it's a it's a little that's difficult great. to touch everything. Yeah, that's really great. good. Hi. Go ahead. Alberto, looks like you have your hands up. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Daniel. I, I welcome I'm very grateful for your presentation. So my challenge here is how do we get stakeholders or the business, okay? How do we get business to align with this epic, with this spike uh, concept? Because, you know, uh, coming from a, maybe if you want to align it to a service organization, to a main organization, to the, to the customer, right? Yeah. I say, oh, you are going to spend four hours of their their precious time they are paying for. Right. For for spike. How does that sound? How does that land? Well, your... how do you how do you get them aligned to do this? Um, to invest two hours a week with per team in epic refinement. And the answer is uh, we need a drum roll or something here. They have to want to. They have to want to. So here's how you can get them to want to. First of all, nobody does anything unless they want to. Every single one of you are here because you want to. And every single one of you is still here from the beginning because you want to, right? As soon as you're done wanting to, you're gonna drop this like a bad habit and leave, right? Uh -huh. So we've gotta, we've gotta be able to give people a reason <laughs> why it's a good investment of their time. Okay, so here's what I want you to do. Let me tell you a story and then I want you to do what I did. I had a client many moons ago, and we talked about how the teams definitely had to be into this and be consenting if we were going to have any chance at all. And in particular, the product managers had to be consenting. So I was given a team with product manager, and I was told that they consented. And then I had a meeting with them, and they were very resting face. You know what I mean? Like they were not enthused to be in the meeting. So I, I, I did like a little throat clearing sound. And I'm like, listen, um, do you guys, did you guys sign up for this? Like, did you volunteer? Because I was told that you volunteered. And then after a long pause, one of the guys just looked down and shook his head. He said, no, we were, we were, we didn't volunteer. We were volunteers. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry. I had no idea. I thought that you, <laughs> Alberto's smiling because he knows how this goes. And I said, I'm so sorry. I came in with the assumption that you wanted to do this with me and, with, and, have, and me, have me help you. So they're like, yeah, we, no, no. So I said, well, listen, you know, here's how this goes. And I, I, I went very quickly through this. I said, would you be willing to do it for two sprints and if those two sprints are not a good investment of time, that would be four total hours. Uh, and no, it'd be eight total hours. It'd be twi uh, two hours once a week, four hours per sprint, eight hours total for two sprints. Would you be willing to try this for two sprints? And if it's not working better than what we're doing now, let's just drop it like a bad habit. How about that? And they said, you know, they looked to the left and they looked to the right and they went, all right, we're going to do that. And then we had a retrospective after the two sprints were over and we had it with the executive leadership team uh, who vol volunteered this, these guys. And here's what the guys who pushed back and didn't want to do it said. The right conversations are happening at the right time. This is an effective use of my time. And I have a suggestion to make it even better. Yeah. And that suggestion was um, um, pre pre slot the meetings in so the recurring meetings at the same time every week 
but about three or four days before the meeting, put the epic in there that's going to be the content of the conversation so we can all do a pre-read. And boom. And this guy was the biggest pushback resistor. And in the in the retrospective, he's like, right conversations are happening, good investment of my time. And here's my idea to make it even better. And then we took that idea and we spread it across the whole, the whole, whole org. So I want you to do the same thing if you get pushback. And the basic strategy is keep asking for less and less mm. until you get a yes out of them, right? Like, hey, would you would you like to marry me? Hell no, I, I don't even know you. Well, how about dinner? No, I don't know who you are, none of this stuff, you know? <laughs> so then you should go away, allow them to recover from your, you know, your, your very forward uh, approach. And then maybe you should ask them out for coffee. You know, early in the day, right? <laughs> and maybe you'll get a yes out of her. So, so, so this, so, uh, this, gonna, this new topic will be Daniel's advice to getting a date. I'm not sure. <laughs> well, well you, there's a lot of similarities here. The, the person who's being invited is asking, what's in it for me? You've got to give them something. Or they're just not going to want to do it. And nobody likes being pushed around. Nobody likes being told what to do. Everyone loves deciding and choosing. In fact, deciding and choosing is one of the most engaging things you can do. So every time you invite, say, a product manager to try this for a couple sprints, you're putting them on a decision. Now you've got them where you want them because they're thinking about your proposal, which is exactly what you want them to be thinking about. Right. So now you're in their head. So instead of forcing people or pushing people around, why don't you ask them? And if they say no, um, use that as data, use that as feedback, use that as an experiment. Every invitation is an experiment, by the way. And then use, use that data to make your next experiment and ask for less. If your, if your technique is good, you're going to win them over, aren't you? Yeah, you are. But if your technique is just nonsense, they're going to drop it like a bad habit, and they should. But you ask them to give it a try. Now, when they ask you, when you ask them to give it a try and they say yes, you are now authorized to authoritatively take them through some really important learning experiences, right? Because now you're authorized to facilitate, set it up, walk them through how this is supposed to work, answer their questions ask them to read a few things. Get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden you're in the driver's seat when you invite. But here's the thing about inviting. You're committed, they're not. What does this mean? If I invite you to dinner at my house, I'm required to have the dinner, but you're not. See? So let's say I was going to invite 10 people to dinner and I said, there's going to be 10 other, there's going to be eight other people there. I'd love you to bring a friend. You don't have to let me know by Friday, and it'll be next Friday. I'm required to have the dinner and, and stage the dinner and deliver the dinner, but you're not required to do anything at all. So actually, when you invite, you are making a commitment. The other person is not. Okay, so that's a little subtle, deep thing about invitation I want you to think about. But invitation is the secret sauce. Okay, let's that, let's get Abby's question and then Karen's question. Does that sound good, Jamie? Yep, that sounds good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Abby? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My question is very simple. It's uh, the slide that says the basic workflow. So while you're doing the presentation, um, under the artifact, where it says the sub uh, epic, um, the ready refinement, I saw the under the engineering team where you have the PO in brackets. So that and it, it feels that it threw me off the balance there. So I just wanted to explain that because and definitely uh, the PO is not an engineering team, but it's in the scrum team. All right, Maybe I'm gonna share my I'm gonna share my screen it. and you tell me what slide, okay? Ready? All right. I'm gonna share my screen. Is it is it this slide? Uh after this, I guess. This one? No, again. Uh, do the next one. It should be after this. It says the basic workflow. I think it should be after this. I'm sorry. Right. You got it. Okay. So 
Yeah, so under the ready refinement, it says the engineering team. And um, I know the, can you just explain this please? Yeah, so this boundary right here, Epic Refinement, the input from Epic Refinement is the big upfront planning process, right? And the output from Epic Refinement is stories that are one sprint wide. Okay. And then that becomes the basis for ready refinement. So these are actually events, epic refinement, ready refinement, sprint planning. But I'm not stating what the data, oh, here it is. Here's the data, epic, sub epics, and ready, right? Mm -hmm. So the team is going to take the sub epics coming out of epic refinement, and that's their starting point. And remember what I said that same size items through a queue go faster? At the beginning of the talk, I mentioned that from lean queuing theory. Yes. Same size items through a queue go faster than variable sized items. So now the team is getting these sub epics that are all the same size, right? So that's going to speed them up because they're getting something uniform every single time that's coming out of epic refinement. They're not dealing with this big one, the small one, this huge one, this little one. You know what I mean? They're all the same size okay. and they have to break it down further because you can't do a sprint on one story. So they got to break that, break down that sub epic into, you know, three or four or five smaller ones if they can. Right. So that's okay. the idea. Does that help? Um, yeah, it does. But can you go further a bit um, on that, the ready refinement where it shows the, uh, the red arrow for the engineering team where you oh, yeah. the PO in brackets? Yeah, these are the roles. So what this means is see the way the PM isn't present? Yes. The PM is not required to be at this this event or this event. Yeah. They, they just come to this event, the epic refinement event, and they get they answer questions. Okay. So I hope so, that helps a little bit. Yeah, it does. So um, my little concern is under the engineering team, uh, with the PO, they do the ready refinements, like a uh, a pre-refinement, right? Yeah, Where they should they do. Definitely... This is team. This is team level refinement, and the PO should be present for that. Okay, if... I'm not seeing the scrum master. There. That's uh, one <laughs> of the. Oh, the scrum master is assumed. I should put that in. There's always a, there's a facilitator at every event if the if the event members want one, right? Okay. So these folks doing epic refinement, these folks doing ready refinement, these folks doing sprint planning, all in blue. If they want a facilitator, then the scrum master jumps in. Okay, that sells it. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. Uh, so all right now, okay. Karen. There's another question, Karen. Yeah, um, I'd like to invite you to go three slides before that last one. Okay. Um, it was this slide where everyone, it, a fair amount of people, including moi, was having um, problems with the uh, uh, acronyms. And oh the yeah, e so so PM is product manager. Not PM the, is product manager. Yeah, PO no, is product not that manager. one. Not that one. Maybe one one before. All right. Or the O R E M lead. Oh okay, right here. Yep, yep, yep. So yeah. So um, go ahead. I think uh, uh, folks, let me speak for myself. We're struggling with the uh, understanding what they were. So I didn't get the concept. I still don't know what OR means. So it's in or, engineering yeah, the, lead. The EM, the EM or the engineering lead. What's, oh, is, is OR just OR? OR, or is it, yeah. The, I have the to word fix that. OR? If, if, you were mis if, if that didn't land for you, I have to change the way the slide looks. <laughs> You think it's a title, okay. but it's actually the word or, yeah. Oh, um, okay. So just go, can you just go over that really quickly? Because I yeah. didn't get it. Uh yeah. During the epic refinement event, technology has to be represented. Otherwise, you're going to miss important information and guidance from the technical leads. So the technical leads are there to confirm and sort of idiot proof any assumptions and make sure that if there's any dependencies or anything else that they are addressed and represented in the epic. Because at that high level, the things were done or because they were done earlier, um, the dependencies and all this, this other technical information about uh, technical domain was not included in the epic. Maybe we thought about it over the last couple of weeks and all of a sudden we realized, right? So at epic refinement, technology needs to be represented by the engineering manager or architect the engineering lead for the team whatever you call them whoever the guidance is 
Okay, and we're right at the end of the minute. We're right at right on the last minute of the of the session. So um, I don't want to talk over um, my kind and gracious hosts. And I, I believe that my time is up. <laughs> well, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it over to Mark here. I I also have a hard stop, but um, Mark's gonna take over as host here, and I'll let you guys decide if you wanna continue for a little bit or or go ahead and end. But I will uh, I will let you know that the recording and the links to the slide deck will be coming um, put, um, later today, hopefully. Anyway, yeah, thank and you. I can stay I can stay for another five or ten minutes if there's questions. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So you've got Daniel for five or 10 minutes. If you want to hold him to that, you got any questions, go ahead and speak up. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Daniel, I have two questions. Um, uh, one question I have is um, regarding um, uh, the way that management looks at the product roadmap and wants to see the progress so can you make any recommendations as to how um of what your experiences tell you that uh, works best in showing the progress of uh, epics uh, uh, sub epics and uh, user stories to management yeah well first of all we should be able to see the tree you know where the epic is at the root and the sub epics are sort of the the branches and the the the, the stories are the the leaves right we should be able to do that audit and kind of go back and say hey where did the story come from, right? What was its path to this team, right? How did it get into the sprint, right? We should be able to see that from all the way back from the beginning. So that's that's the first thing. Second thing is, if you're gonna get progress, well, first of all, I want you to look up 90% syndrome and then, the, and then you can add the word product, project management. So 90% syndrome project management. It's the idea that when you ask people to report on how they're doing, they're always 90% done. Okay, but they haven't delivered it, <laughs> but they haven't delivered anything, right? So I have to take it on trust. So what we want to do is we, as much as possible, we want to deliver partial deliveries of something that works. So if you look up vertical slices, we want to take these epics and as much as possible, we want to make epics out of some of these sub epics out of some of these vertical slices that we can create out of the big epic that that is a starting point right so fundamentally what this is going to allow teams to do is every month or so or even every sprint if they're really good they can demo something that actually works you know on uh on uh you know some platform right um the developer platform you know sometimes that's called uh has, has different names or um you know, UAT, which is like the middle middle ground, and then production, right? So we want to be able to deliver something that PMs can actually demonstrate to stakeholders, internal and external. And that's going to require a organize, organizing the sub-epics so that they are vertical slices. So the sub-epic is expressing a vertical slice that will be delivered in a month instead of th the whole thing in three months. So that's how I would track progress is through um, partial deliveries of things that actually work. And not every epic is going to allow vertical slicing, by the way. But you should come up with some way to show them something that's actually working on um, a, a delivery or pre-delivery platform. So that's my answer to that. Did I, did I answer that one okay? Uh, Give me a good indication. Thank you. All right. And what's the other one? What's your other question? Uh, well, the other question is um, that uh, when you start with a new platform, uh, you have a lot of technical uh, things that need to be done. So basically, you don't have much to show uh, to your stakeholders. Um, so uh, do you have any tips on how to balance that out, especially with, uh, with, with a lot of investment that needs to be done in the beginning? Yeah. Uh, Okay, so the question is, when we're building something new, um, the platforms are also under construction sometimes, and of course the code's under construction, and the UI's under construction. So how do we show them something early in the cycle? Is that the, the question? That's correct. All right, so what I would do is I would dramatically dumb down the user interface 
and give them a command line or something ridiculously simple that's, that does run. In other words, punt on the UI, but show them that the background processes are working, right? That the business logic is being dealt with, the database is being dealt with, that, that, that outputs are going out and, and it's coming all the way back with a, with a, um, with a, a return value. Right, proving that we've we've got the we've got the plumbing working. We just have an ugly UI right now because we in the this is an, a UI we're going to throw away. The only reason we built it was to show you something. Okay, so that's what I would do. I would I would avoid building out the whole UI and just show them that the plumbing is working. And that's how I would show them progress. I want to say one more thing because we're really at the end now. We only have six more minutes, right? progress the, the the felt sense of progress is a major psychological need for everyone everyone is a junkie for progress everyone loves you when you can show progress everyone wants to feel movement in progress okay so if you tune into this you're going to see that this is a fundamental axiom truth about how humans uh, um, have good psychological health and feel good. Okay, if you're not if you're not in progress in your life, you feel like you're just stuck. Like you're not doing anything. You're not going anywhere. What what do we you know? What's the point, right? So some sense of progress is absolutely key. So you always want to show progress in your demos because that's going to give everyone that up vibe that they want okay if you've ever gotten off a highway that's 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 crowded or a freeway that's crowded and you went on the side streets just to keep moving you know exactly what i'm talking about it's like i'm just parked on this freeway i'm getting off i don't know these other roads and i actually don't care i'm at the end of my rope on this i want forward movement right Right, right. Some of you are laughing kind of hard. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah. And that's how it goes. So you want to deliver progress, and this is why too much work in progress is what kills team, uh, the team vibe, because nothing's done. There's something really, really strong psychologically about stamping it done. Right. So. Having a clear definition of done, coding to the definition of done, declaring victory on the definition of done in the demo. That stuff's super important for your teams. It's super important for your stakeholders. And quite frankly, it's super important for you as a scrum master because you're rated on their forward progress. Right? I mean, you're successful when they're successful. So what is success? It's forward movement through the work, right? So I've given you my my um, my uh, my rant on that. People need a sense of control. They need a sense of progress, and they need a sense of belonging. Okay, control, progress, and belonging is a secret sauce. You deliver that as a scrum master. You're going to kill it with your teams. Control, progress, and belonging. And it's the perceived senses of these things. Give them a sense of control. So, for example, when you ask them to do something, give them a range of options and let them pick one. That would give them a sense of control. Inviting gives a sense of control. You're not required to do anything as the invitee. Right? You have, you're in charge. The invitee is in charge of what happens next. So invite your teams to experiment. Invite your teams to try a couple of things differently. Um, let them pick one of those things. Make, try to give them a range of options if you can and reduce their work and progress as much as you possibly can so that they feel done at the end of the sprint and they have that hell yeah feeling, right? That's what you want. So two minutes ago, I've got to go away. Um, how many people are here? Oh, there's still so many people here. Still 58. I was going to say, Daniel, that sounds like a pretty good wrap up on your, on okay. your session. Thank you. Thank yeah, you kindly. I'm, glad, I'm glad I made a couple of you laugh once in a while. 
Well, I have a follow-up question though. My name is Catherine. How do you reduce work in progress though if there are those are things that they have committed to complete? Oh, oh, oh now you have to ask that question at the end. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so here's what you can do. Here, here's what you can do. You can you can send me an email. My email's in the chat. If you came late, you won't see it. So here, I'll show you this last slide. Um, well, I have all these extra slides at the end, so it doesn't look that way. Okay, here. Okay, this is it right here. Okay, so just here's my email, and I'll put it in the chat too. Just contact me here. You send me a personal email, and I'll I'll answer your question for you. Okay. Great. And we'll do it like that. So no. Thanks a lot, Dan. Nobody's nobody's disappointed, right? No, not at all. Everyone's happy. Well, almost everyone's happy. There's always someone who's unhappy. Thank you, Daniel. Thank okay, you you're so welcome. Much. All right. Good thanks, luck. Daniel. Thanks, everybody. Thank yep. you so much. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.